Okay, so plan of attack for the next couple of days uh, to get through all of the gases. There are a lot of, of rules and stuff that goes along with uh, gas chemistry, but I think they all fit together pretty well and are pretty straightforward, uh, unlike some of the things are not quite as uh, conceptual um, in nature. It's like the, the nuclear chemistry, the bonding, um, all of that type of thing. So what we will be, pull this up, looking at, oh, you know what? Let me share this screen. Okay, what we will be looking at, there it is right there. Of course, uh, we got through our first midterm right there, class 16. Um, we'll start on gases. We'll finish gases tomorrow, and then uh, then we'll get back into our normal lecture on starting the lecture on a topic on Thursday, finishing it up, and taking a quiz on the previous um, every Friday. That seems to be a good kind of rhythm that we are into. And I have released or, or put in announcements uh, for the class, all the classes from class 17, which is today, up to our final class right there when you'll take your final test and the topics that will be covered and the homework that will be submitted and the quizzes that will be taken um, from now until the end of the class. So yeah, you just have the midterm and the final. The final is not cumulative. The cumulative covers the material from today until, uh, let's see, I don't, da, 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 da. Yeah. I present lipids, but um, that will not be on the final. But I'll give you a midterm review, um, as I always do. So you'll have a, a really good idea of what's actually going to show up on the midterm. So while you will be introduced to the last topic, um, I just don't feel you have enough time to internalize that information and learn it for the final. So not fair, right? Okay, so that is what we are doing. So let's get that out of there. So gases, uh, but of course, okay, so you should see a slide deck, should be able to hear me, everyone is, so I don't have to keep my eyes peeled for anyone coming into class, but there we go. Can everyone see my slide deck and my whiteboard up right now? Yeah. Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay, uh, gases. So what we're going to be looking at is the movement of gases in general. So here is the breakdown. We'll be looking at, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six laws. The first four, the ones that I kind of concentrate my time on, uh, Boyle's Law, Charles's Law, Gay-Lussac's Law. I hope I always, I should look up the pronunciation of that, but Gay-Lussac, I think it's French. Uh, the combined gas law, which basically combines the uh, first three laws into a combined gas law. And Avogadro's Law. Um, will be the next one, then Dalton's Law, which you'll see. Dalton's Law is just basic addition. And what you're doing, essentially, as you look at these different laws, the first three is you are um, looking at a different uh, set of variables of the main variables in the uh, activity of gases. In the combined gas laws, you put them all together. In Avogadro's Law, you are looking at the num how the number of molecules of gas affect the variables, pressure, volume, and temperature, okay? So that is what we'll be looking at. So um, interesting factoids, our atmosphere is 21% oxygen. So the vast majority of the person on the street, if you ask them what is the most abundant gas in Earth's atmosphere, they'll say oxygen and they would be completely wrong. The most abundant gas is nitrogen, okay? 
ozone uh, that we hear so much about is a tiny fraction of our upper atmosphere. And carbon dioxide, the other uh, gas that we hear a lot about um, and influences uh, public policy, national policy, all of that stuff, and potentially um, um, how much our atmosphere is going to warm up during our lifetimes is a, a pretty darn uh, small percentage. Um, well, less, about less than 1% uh, currently is carbon dioxide. Okay, so all of these laws are based on the kinetic molecular theory, which just says that gases in, or uh, molecules in gaseous form um, move in straight lines under the influence of uh, uh, first law of motion until they hit something. They don't really attract one another or repulse one another. They are very far spaced out and um, they are not very dense. So they occupy a large um, volume and the action of gas is directly related to the amount of kinetic energy or heat, okay, the temperature that the molecules in the gas um, are subjected to or contain the energy that they have, all right? So the four properties of a gas that we are going to be using as, our, as we work our way through these laws are the pressure, which is how hard the gas molecules are bouncing off um, the container, okay? The volume, which is the space that a gas occupies. The temperature, which is a, an expression of the amount of energy, kinetic energy. In this case of gas particles, basically how hard they're bouncing off the walls of the container. And uh, the quantity of gas, number of molecules. Okay. okay, first of all, so I went through those to so the volume is the container that the gas is in. The temperature is the measurement of the kinetic energy. Now, this is where we're going to get to use Kelvin a lot, especially when we're looking at Charles's law. Yeah, the second law. Boyle's law, we don't worry about temperature. But um, you're going to get, want to very much remember how to change from a Celsius to Kelvin, Kelvin to Celsius, plus or minus that 273 degrees, okay? And as a gas cools, um, there is less kinetic energy, pressure goes down, volume goes down, and vice versa. As you increase the temperature and energy in the system, there is pressure that is a measurement of the um, uh, pressure is a me measurement of the pressure in a system, and uh, the one that we see most often every day, if you watch the news, is a measurement of the millimeters of mercury. So, if you're uh, generally in the United States, when you're when you go to the weather site and, and look for the barometric pressure, they're talking about millimeters of mercury, which is just a measure of how hard the atmosphere is pressing down on a column of mercury. I'll look at a barometer in our next slide. Okay, so millimeters of mercury, one of the main measurements of pressure, an atmosphere is equals one at sea level. Okay, on Earth, one atmosphere is the amount of pressure pressing, uh, pressing down due to the atmosphere at sea level. And obviously, as you increase in altitude, uh, pressure decreases because you have less atmosphere over the top of you, okay? Uh, I'm not going to look at pascals or kilopascals, but if we were able to spend some more time together and get more into this, we'd look at that. Uh, and PSA are pounds per square inch uh, to see that when you're filling up your tires, keeping that at 35 to 50 PSI, if I remember correctly, in a typical tire in the United States. But the thing we'll look at most of this that you want to keep the relationship uh, close at hand on the tip of your brain is the relationship of millimeters of mercury to tor, 
to atmosphere, and one millimeter of hydrogen equals one tor. Those are interchangeable units. A tor is equal to a millimeter of mercury, and an atmosphere, now look at that, is equal to 760 millimeters of hydrogen. Yeah, right there, 760 millimeters of hydrogen is equal to one atmosphere, which is also equal to 760 tor. Okay, millimeters are equal to tors, 760 of either millimeters of hydrogen or tor is equal to one atmosphere. Okay, so that gives you a nice tool um, to do some calculations. Okay, and that's a barometer. Barometer, you have pure mercury with a column and the atmosphere pressing down on that will force the uh, mercury up the column at sea level 760 millimeters okay okay and then as i mentioned at sea level uh atmospheric pressure is equal to one atmosphere and then as you go up mountains it will decrease accordingly to your increase in altitude pretty straightforward okay so another thing uh, in weather, when they're always talking about high pressure and low pressure, that's we're talking about the changes in atmospheric pressure due to weather patterns. So generally, when you have a, a high or rising pressure, um, you have stable and more warm, um, stable and more warm weather. Okay, so and it's around 30-ish, 29 and a half-ish to 30-ish. Okay, and rising, yeah, you're probably going to have good weather. If you have a low pressure, um, exactly what happened, uh, or a, f a rapidly falling barometric pressure, you're in for stormy weather because um, all the atmosphere is being mixed up and the uh, atmosphere is fluctuating quite rapidly. So falling barometric pressure generally means crummy weather. High barometric pressure generally means warm or more stable weather. All right, so there we go. An atmosphere, a millimeters of mercury, tor. Okay, those first three are the big ones that we'll be looking at. Okay, of course, you convert millimeters to inches. And yeah, the rest of them, there they are. I'm not going to worry. The first three, I am going to worry. All right. Okay, so there we are at sea level, 760 Los Angeles is almost at sea level. If we go all the way up to the top of Mount Everest, you'll see that you have almost, not quite a, uh, about a third, yeah, about, a, uh, yeah, about a third of the atmospheric pressure. If you uh, go up Mount Everest, then you would at in Seattle at the waterfront. Again, that's why you need supplemental oxygen because, of course, you go from that 21% of 760, right, at sea level up to 21% of uh, three times less than that. So you need the supplemental oxygen to survive up in the kill zone where you're running out of oxygen, no matter how much you try and huff and puff. Okay. Okay, so quickly, what can we do with this? So what is 475? You know, 475 millimeters of mercury mm -hmm, in atmospheres. Okay. So there we go. We can set up our conversion, right? This should be old hat to you guys by now. You're starting with millimeters of mercury. You want to find out how um, how many atmospheres that is. We know for every one atmosphere, we have 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. Cross those out. We are left with atmospheres. Perform your calculations. 475 divided by 760. 0.625 atmospheres is the equivalent of uh, 475 millimeters of mercury. Okay, let's look at another one. Uh, so we have a pressure in the tire that is two atmospheres. 
how many millimeters of mercury is that? Well, we have our two atmospheres. We set up our conversion for every one atmosphere. We have 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, double check. Our units cancel out, leaving us with the unit that is requested. So 2 times 760 will give us... Oops. 760 times 2 is uh, 1,520. All right, there we go, 475, 625. I guess I could have just pulled that up, but uh, sometimes seeing someone work through it is, is better. I always find it better for my brain to see it being actually being worked through. Okay, so our first of our laws, Boyle's Law, is... The following, it is the relationship of volume pressure, okay? It is the relationship of volume and pressure in two systems, okay? So I was saying the, the pressure and volume in one system is proportional to the pressure and volume in the second system, okay? Provided, and this is important, temperature does not change, okay? And the molecules of gas in the system do not change, okay? So here we have, I'll just write down, Boyle's Law is the following. The pressure in the first system and the volume in the first system is equivalent to the pressure in the second system and the volume in the second system. Okay, doesn't look like much. Extremely useful though, as most things that in science are. The simpler they are, oftentimes the more useful they are. Okay. Again, remember, we are keeping a constant, constant, it, Okay, temp and constant number of molecules. Okay, pressure and volume one, pressure and volume two. Okay, so this is the reason why when you inhale, diaphragm relaxes, increases the volume of the lungs, thus lowering the pressure and uh, pressure goes lower than uh, surrounding atmospheric pressure by a few millimeters of, of uh, mercury, a few uh, tor, and air goes in to equalize that system. That's exactly what's happening. So let's put rubber to the road and do calculations because, you know, I'm always going to be asking you to use this stuff to calculate. And we have uh, somewhat of a story problem here, but we can approach this just like we do every other story problem. Pull out the stuff that is useful and apply the appropriate, uh, and plug it into the uh, appropriate equation, which in this case is Boyle's Law. Okay, so we have some freon, which is carbon chloride, fluoride, uh, in refrigeration, and we want the new volume of an 8-liter sample. Let's write that 8 liters. We know that's volume one, okay, of Freon. And the pressure one is the next sentence. Initially at a pressure of 550 millimeters of mercury or 550 tor, okay? And we're going to change the pressure. So pressure two is going to be 220. No, 2,200 Boop. millimeters of mercury. And they want to know what is the volume in the second system once you increase the pressure. Okay. So use your in intuition for just a second and see, is the volume going to be larger or smaller? when you change the pressure. Okay. Now there are two ways you can approach this. Um, 
I'll, I'll do it both ways so that, uh, and then you can use with the, the first, uh, the way that works um, best for you. Okay, so you can just take, so once you've identified these variables, you can just take Boyle's law and put them one, pressure one is 550. And I'm just going to put Tor there. It's a little easier because it's the same. Um, the volume one is eight liters. Okay. And we want to know what pressure or volume two is when the pressure is changed 2,200 Tor. Okay. So, of course, to solve that, multiply 550 times 8 and divide it by 2200. Okay, so that gives us 2 liters is the new volume. Okay. So you can do it that way or you can get out ahead of this. You know you have, let's see, go a little room here. P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. We know we want V2. So solving this for the equation, we know we're going to P1, V1 divided by P2 is going to be equal to V2. Just doing some real basic algebraic manipulation. And then you can plug there into there, P2 into P2 our P1 into P1, and then P2 into P2. It works out to the same thing, and obviously that is going to give you the same answer. V2 is equal to 2 liters. Okay? Either way. Um, different ways of getting to the same place. All right? And, yeah. They just walked through it. Uh, they went ahead and solved the V2 is equal to V1 times P1 over P2, which is what I wrote over here. And then put the given numbers in and out came the correct answer of two liters. All right, so let's look at another example. We have a sample of oxygen gas. Work through it with me here, now that you've been exposed to it. Um, has a volume um, of 12 liters at 600 milliliters of mercury. And what is the new pressure? So we know that P2 is our unknown when the volume changes to 36.0 liters. Okay, so we know, I guess we may as well stay consistent. So we know volume one is 12, pressure one is 600, and volume two is 36. Okay, boils off P1, V1 equal to P2, V2. We want to solve for P2. So P1 times V1 is equal, uh, divided by V2 is equal to P2. Okay, so let's put, let's put everything in. P2 is equal to P1, which is 600. V1, which is equal to 12.0, get our significant figures all there, and V2 is equal to 36. I get up our calculators, 600 times 12 divided by 36, P2 is equal to 200 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Make sure I did that right. Okay.
Okay, there is a solution right there, three sides later. P2 is equal to the 200 millimeters of mercury. Okay, any questions about that? Good. So uh, let's let's do a, a thinking experiment here. If we have the initial system here with a piston on top of some gas, and you lower the piston in the first case or raise the piston, so you are decreasing the volume in the first case, you are increasing the volume in the second case. Is the pressure going to be higher in A than the initial? Yes. Okay. And the pressure will be lower since you've increased the volume. So that's the thinking process of all of this mess that we work through to demonstrate Boyle's law. Visually, that is what's happening as you're changing those pressures. And they're directly proportional in gas, gaseous systems. Okay. So let's do one. Um, if we have a sample of helium gas as a volume of 120 milliliters, I'll go a little faster. So the volume is 120 milliliters and a pressure of 850 millimeters of mercury. What is the new volume? If the pressure is changed to 425 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Okay. So you know that you are taking pressure out of the system, so you're going to have more volume, just like we saw right here going into it. But by how much, we can just set up our equation. Uh, P1V1 is equal to P2V2. And as long as we're in the same units, we don't have to do any conversion. So we have milliliters. Okay, so our answer is going to be in milliliters. We have mercury millimeters and mercury millimeters. So those are all the same. So no conversion. So they're all the same. And we want to know what the da, 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 the new volume so v2 so let's do what we have v2 is equal to p1 v1 divided by p2 okay and now that's v1 that's p1 that's V2, and that's P2. So V2 is equal to uh, pressure 1, 850, times V1, which is 120, all divided by P2, which is 425. The new volume is 240. So the volume did go up, just as we predicted. Okay. And if you look at it, it went up. Another one just to make sure that we're internalizing. It went up by how much? It doubled from 120. to 240 in this case because the pressure halved from 850 to 425. So half as much pressure will increase the volume by a factor of two. Okay, answer is C, good. <laughs> Make sure, always a little sigh of relief when I, I see that I worked out a problem right. And let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let's stop 
pretty much right here. And we'll start with Charles's law. We went through Boyle's law, P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. And we'll start with Charles' law, um, the relationship between temperature and volume at a constant pressure. We've looked in, at the relation of, of pressure and volume at a, uh, a constant temperature in Charles's or in Boyle's law. In Charles's law, we're going to swap out our, uh, our constant number. Okay, so visually, if you have the initial balloon here on the left and it has a, a volume of 6.4 liters and a pressure of 0.7 atmospheres, if you double the pressure, is the new balloon going to be visually here A, B, or C? Well, if you think about it, if you double um, uh, the pressure, by twice, pressing in on it, you are going to decrease the volume. Actually, the initial volume and B are the same. If you cross out the other two, you can see they're exactly the same. Um, and you would obviously not going to get a larger volume at lower pressure. You're going to get a smaller volume at higher pressure. All right, and then we'll start with that tomorrow. There will, there will definitely be someone, particularly when we're looking at, at um, um, where temperature is a, a not a constant and a variable, you're definitely going to have to do conversions between Celsius and Kelvin to keep the, um, the units the same. Yeah. And, Uh, it's yeah, well, it's possible. I'm trying to think if I have any anything. Let me look at the homework really quick to tell you the truth. But yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, keeping keep, yeah to keep the uh, I mean the the secret to remember, um, except for temperature, as long as you keep the units the same the units are the same. You don't want to be doing millimeters of hydrogen and atmospheres for P1 and P2. You either want them both to be in atmospheres or both to be in Tor, right? That's kind of the key to, to that whole sticky wicket. But... Uh, I could just make something up off the top of my head too, and hopefully it'll work out if I don't see anything I like. Ah, what the heck? I'll just make one up. So, so convergence inside of Boyle's law. So let's say you have uh, a pressure of one point five atmosphere pressure one is 1.5 atmosphere volume one is two liters okay pressure two will be mm, Three hundred and eighty tor. What is the second volume? Okay. 
something like that. Is that what you were kind of uh, thinking of, Alexis? Yeah. So what I would say, so so we we want since we have um, atmospheres and tor, we need to convert one of them into atmospheres or tor. We just got and it doesn't matter. We can pick one or the other. So let's just convert our P2 into atmospheres. Okay. So we have 380 tor. And for every one atmosphere, we have 760 tor, right? So that, that, and so that is 0 0.5 atmosphere. Okay, you can really can just plug that in one zero point five atmosphere, and so P one V one is equal to P two V two. Okay, pressure one is one point five atmosphere. That volume is two liters. Pressure two is 0 0.5 atmosphere. And we don't know what the second volume is. Okay, but we can just calculate it really quickly. 1.5 times two divided by 0.5. So six liters will be the volume of that same, um, at the same temperature, same number of molecules. We'll take up six liters of space in the second system that is at um, 0 0.5 atmospheres. Okay, yeah. Ah, okay. So let's just, let's actually go through and, and look, let's solve this. So V2 is equal to P1, oop, and I see I put a wrong thing there. P1 V1, okay, um, over P2, right? Uh Yes. Okay. So, so pressure one was 1.5 atmosphere. Volume one was 2.0 liters. And pressure two was 0 0.5 atmospheres, right? Okay, so that's we have these units on top of each other. An atmosphere over an atmosphere is going to cancel out, and that's going to leave us with liters as our unit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and then 1.5 times 2 divided by 0.5, and then gives us our 6 liters right there. Yeah, units cancel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the short answer is yes, you'll you'll be able to look that up. Um, but I would the only th number you really need to remember is 760, right for one atmosphere and you can do all your calculations from that. As far as, far as pressure so 700. 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 tor. Those both equal one atmosphere. Yeah, those are all just different ways of saying the same thing. A rose is a rose. Oh, oh let's see. I got, what do we have here? 
a quiz tomorrow. No, there will be no quiz tomorrow, but let me um, show you. If, any, if you ever have a question about when there is a quiz, what you should access is the following. Go into your, bum, 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 the class that we're on in announcements um, today is 17. We had our lecture on gases. And then you'll see in class tomorrow, we're going to continue on our gases with a, a lecture. And then I'm going to release your homework that will be due on the following Friday. And then we will have a, a quiz on gases also on the following Friday. And where it says quiz on uh, gases uh, on 20, which is uh, a week from tomorrow. So. If you ever have those questions, it's all there laid out in uh, our announcements for the class. Um, yeah, well, from the dates they're posted. Yeah, pay, pay no, never mind. That's just when they're, yeah, yeah, that's just a, 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 a leftover uh, from Blackboard stuff so yeah if you just pay attention to the class you're in uh, and what we're doing that day and what's due that day then you can always uh, keep track of of what's due and when it's due mm -hmm. seven no 18 would be tomorrow Yeah, 18th uh, class today and then class tomorrow in class is what we'll be doing tomorrow. Uh, class 19 will be uh, a week from today. Class 20 will be a week from tomorrow. Which works for this class. I, I can't say that all the time because the, 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 this class schedule changes all the time. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I have had people just create a, um, uh, a calendar and just put the classes on the day that corresponds to the class if they'll be in class too. And some, some folks have done that as well. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, okay. Any other questions? All right. So I will.